Okay, any questions about anything? Finding your way around the beginning of the semester okay? Are they teaching ECE 2400 this semester? No? Okay. That was last semester. I think one of these days is probably going to be offered every semester, but I'm not sure. Anyway. Are you going to fill out any office hours before the homework is due? I've been nudging the TAs, you know, <laughs> like one of them said, well, I can, do, I can do Fridays except for this week. The other one said, oh, I can do Wednesday, you know, that kind of thing. So I said, please tell me how you settle that up so I can tell the class, you know, and there's a Slack workspace. I'm not a Slack person. I'm learning how to use it a little bit. I keep checking there. I don't find any new info. So, you know, and, and someone sent me an email over the weekend saying, are there going to be any office hours before the homework? And I copied that to all the TI, TAs, FYI, please get back to me on this, you know. I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping. Yeah. And if you have questions, you can, and you can't find it, you know, if they don't do it, you can always get in touch with me and I can, I can help you out. Anything else? Yeah. What's happening with the lab? Yeah. Well, this week is the, you, you remember that first optional lab on the MATLAB review? The TAs are going to show up at the lab sections this week and hang out and help anyone who wants to talk about that. Oh. Okay. And I think the first lab lab, you know, where, where you, you're actually going to do some things uh, with MATLAB and everything is probably going to be the week after next, but it might be next week. I have to look and see. It depends on how much we cover today, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Yeah, if you show up to the lab section, they'll help you out with the homework as well, if you want. I mean, they're not like committed to only talking about MATLAB that whole time, you know. So, yeah. Where, where do we determine the homework? Homework, uh, you may. <coughs> they're outside of this door. There's this black cabinet with a lot of slots labeled. There's one for this class. If you do a hard copy of your homework, you can put it in there. Or, if you prefer, you can email to me, and I can send it to the graders. Send it to the TAs. And usually what happens is there's maybe 10 or 12 people in the class who like to do some fancy LaTeX version of their homework and they send it to me and whatever. <coughs> Otherwise, yeah. Is there only one Dropbox or is there like a Dropbox for the lab section? Only one Dropbox. Yeah, the lab, the lab in general, you're not going to be having to hand stuff in to be graded, you know. You're going to be like showing the TA and getting checked off basically, you know. So that's. That's not, we're not going to have like paper graded lab report kind of things. Yep. Do you get checked off the menu lab section? Well, theoretically, the reason that the lab sections are set up the way they are is enrollment size, you know, fire code. You know, you don't want some cop to come by 303 Phillips and find out there's, you know, 29 people in a room that's only designed for 21 or, you know, something like that. So, <laughs> so that's why, but, but, you know, in a given week, maybe you're going to have an interview or you're going to do something, you know, you can't make your lab section, you know, and I, I don't think it's going to be any problem to show up to another one, but it might, the grading recording might get confusing for the TAs. We, we can figure it out. They're, they're smart people, so, you know. Any other questions? Okay. S no? All right. So let's keep, let's continue talking about these signals and stuff. And specifically, the big, the big deal thing we talked about last time was the two-sided spectral representation of a signal x of t. That's a finite sum of pure real valued sinusoids or si yeah sinusoids so, that. so anything that you can write and, and that includes sinusoids of frequency zero namely constants and essentially what we did was this thing can be complicated as a time function, it need not be periodic. It could go all over the place. 
But the spectral representation is a nice, simple little stem plot that tells you all about the signal. Okay, so this, the spectral or spectrum, if you want to call it, is a, just a compact way of describing this X of T. And it has various properties, like for example, we saw that how to get the spectral representation by you know, figuring out the phasor amplitudes and whatever, and we did a couple of examples. We made some observations about it, that if the spectrum has a stem at frequency f over here in the positive f space, it has a stem of the same length with a different label, that's the complex conjugate of the label, there's a conjugate symmetry to the spectrum, and so on. Okay, so we saw some properties. For example, conjugate symmetry. And this is a consequence of the stipulation that x of t be real valued. Okay, and at the end of class last time I said I wanted to do two, two more examples of ways of putting sinusoids together and figuring out what's going on with those spectrally. And we finished one of them. Okay, so we looked at these things called the spectrum of beat signals and talked about how they come up in real life. And today, and today what I want to do is one more example. So next, I want to look at one more example. And one of the reasons we look at this example is because it's a vehicle for an, a rule that you can use to manipulate spectra that saves you some time at some point. So one more example. And these are so-called AM, or amplitude modulated signals. OK, so what does is, what is an amplitude modulated signal look like? It, it looks something like this. You take, it's going to look like x of t equals s of t times some cosine. And the cosine is going to be something like this. It's going to be 2 pi fct. And by the way, you can do this with phases. I'm not going to do it with phases in class because that just, you know, it's not worth carrying around that baggage in lecture. Maybe we'll do it on the homework. Where, and here s of t is a slowly varying signal. What does that mean? Well, essentially it means that its highest frequency pieces have frequencies way below fc the frequency of the cosine. So s of t is a slowly varying signal. So the frequency content is at frequencies way below fc. And it also satisfies the constraint that it's positive for all t. All right, so that's what an amplitude modu modulated signal looks like. And in the time domain, what is this going to look like if we graphed it as a function of t? So graphing such a thing as a function of t what do you get? You get something like this. Suppose, you know, S of t looks like that versus t. And then you're going to have that down here as well, just reflected. And inside here, you're going to have something that's going up and down at frequency fc. So this looks somewhat like a picture we drew last time where we had just the product of two cosines, one of which was low frequency and one of which was high frequency. But the difference here is that the envelope of the signal never passes through 0. All right, so here, what do we got? We've got s of t is the dotted curve. And the oscillations in here happen at frequency fc. So
So what you've got here is you've got a high frequency cosine whose amplitude is modulated by the time function s of t. So, and again, this is x of t. And this is the name for the so that's why we call it an AM signal. Okay, so that's what X of T looks like as a time function. And after we go through the spectral discussion of this, I want to talk about you know, where these come up in practice. Most of you have probably heard of radio. Okay, Maybe some of you haven't. If you've heard of radio, you've probably heard of AM radio versus FM radio, right? This is the kind of signal flying around with AM radio signals. Question, yes? The modulation envelope does not pass through zero, correct. What, what is distinct about like, in the equation that results in that? The fact that S of T is always positive. Oh. Got it? Yeah, that would do it. Yeah, that would do it. <laughs> yeah, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that because, because it turns out that, well, when we get to AM radio, you'll see why. Okay, so. So, for example, this would be a sinusoid that's shifted up. Yeah, and that, that, that's exactly the example I'm going to do in a sec. Yep. OK, so anyway, w question, what is the spectrum of this guy? What is the spectrum of this guy? Well, it turns out that, that you, can, you can figure out the spectrum by using something called the frequency shift rule for spectra. Now, this part of the course, we're only talking about spectra of finite linear combos of pure sinusoids. But it turns out that there's a way of talking about spectra for much more general class of signals. And I'm going to just assume that we have a way of talking about the spectrum of S of t. So what do we do? Say you have first, what you do is you get the spectrum of s of t. Okay? And in the example we do, s of t is going to be a sum of sinusoids. But as I say, you can do this. You can get spectra in a lot more general context, but we're, we're not going to go there for now. First, get the spectrum of s of t. Then you get the spectrum of x of t as follows. What you do is you take the spectrum of S of t and shift it to the right by Fc and cut the height in half. And then you shift it to the left by Fc, cut the height in half, and then you add those two pictures together. So you shift spec of S of t right by Fc and half the amplitude. And then you shift it left by FC, also half the amplitude. And then you add those two graphs together. They're not really graphs, they're stem plots in the case where S of t is a superposition of cosines. So add two plots together. And that will give you the spectrum of X of t. Now this, this rule turns out to be true even when S of t is not a superposition of, of sinusoids. But we're only going to look at it in that case because that's what we're restricting our attention to for this part of the course. So let's look at an example. 
and this will, the CU Air guy, what's your name, by the way? Jack. Jack, okay, I just wanted to say, CU Air logo is my absolutely favorite Cornell logo. I mean, I think, no, totally, who, is there anyone else here on CU Air? No? I, I love that little boomerang wing thing, you know, it's just the perfect size and the perfect angle and everything about that, I love that. I know, but you know, when I said that to my friend Dan Eddowes, who was, who was a big CU Air guy for several years, he said, oh, well, we're going to redesign it. And I'm like, no, no, you know, like there's this, there's this van that's parked behind um, Rhodes a lot that has this big C and I walk by it every day and I'm like, ah, oh, that's such a cool logo. I love that logo. Okay. It's way better than Cornell ECEs can do everything. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Everything, not anything, everything. <laughs> That's the ECE is supposed to be, anyway. All right, so anyway, example. When S of T is particularly simple, how about S of T equals, say, 7 plus 3 cosine 2 pi times 440t. Okay, so here, here's an example. Like Jack was saying earlier, so s of t could be a cosine shifted up. Yeah, that's what I'm doing here. It's a cosine shifted up by 7. Now, why is this s of t always positive? Well, the cosine bops between plus and minus 1, max height 3, minus 3. So the 7 always makes sure that's positive. This thing is always bigger than or equal to 4. All right, so that means that x of t, so given, say, fc, much bigger than 440, which is the number of hertz for that cosine. Okay, so it could be on the order of megahertz or kilohertz. So how about fc equals, say, uh, 770 kilohertz, right? Why would I pick that number? Well, you'll see. X of t is going to equal 7 plus 3 cos 2 pi 440t, all that times cos 2 pi times 770,000t. Okay? Let's figure out the spectrum of X of t. There are two ways you can do that in this case, at least two ways. One way is to do what I called last time, and I'm going to reuse this phrase, you go full Euler on it, OK? Remember that, what that means? We could get x of t spectrum by going full Euler on it. And what does that mean? That just means take every cosine in sight and expand it using Euler's formulas as a sum of complex exponentials. And then you, the, the spectrum coefficients spit right out, and you know right where to put them and everything. But let's, just for practice, let's use the frequency shift rule that we just talked about. So instead, let's use the frequency shift rule. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we, we, we get the spectrum of S of t. It's a first step. What's that? This is the kind of thing we did on Thursday last week. So this is f. And what do we got? We've got 7 plus 3 cosine. So we have a spectral line, as they call it, a stem of height 7 at f equals 0. And if you split the cosine into 3 halves e to the j 2 pi 440t plus 3 halves e to the minus j 2 pi 440t, that gives rise to spectral stems at plus and minus 440 hertz of height 3 halves with no phase. All 
Okay, so does everybody see just how essentially by inspection of S of T using the techniques of last time, that's our two-sided spectral representation of S of T. All right. Now what do we do? We follow this prescription here. We shift that to the right by FC, half the amplitude. Shift it to the left by FC, half the amplitude and add the two plots together. So follow the recipe. Above, that is to say shift, half, etc. to get this as the spectrum of x of t. OK, we're going to have a big gap here in F space. And out here you've got, say, this is going to be 770,000. And you're going to have a big gap over here. And out here you're going to have minus that. Right? And centered on 770,000 is going to be that picture half the height. So you're going to have a 7 half spectral line here. And then you're going to have one out here, which is going to be, say, 3 fourths high. And what is this going to be? This is going to be at 77440. And then you're going to have one over here at 3 fourths. And this frequency here is going to be this minus 440, which is what? Like 769. <laughs> 769,560, is that right? And then you're going to have this same picture over here. Same, same exact thing. Seven halves in the middle, and then something out here, something out here. OK. There you go. So that's how you get, that's what the spectrum of an AM signal looks like. It looks like. The spectrum of the slowly varying signal who, yes, question? Uh, so what was the difference between like S of T and X of T? Like why, why did you not have to do that when you plotted S of T? Yeah, S of T, X of T is S of T times a high frequency cosine. So X of T, this is S of T. This is the low frequency thing times a very high frequency cosine, you know. So that's the difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry if it's not legible. No, it's half the height of seven. And then these guys are half the height of three halves, so they're three fourths. We good? Yeah. Why do you have to? Okay, I'm just telling you the rule. I'm not deriving it, but. If you went full Euler on this, you would see why the halves come up. Okay, so so full Euler is like a fail-safe method to do anything with cosines. You know, so that that's probably if I were in this class as an undergrad, that you know I was always looking for foolproof ways of doing problems. Like physics was hard for me because the professors would always say, "Well, by symmetry, we, you know." I'm like, "No, don't do that." You know, just tell me. Like, tell me a mechanical way of doing this problem without appealing to my intuition, OK? And the corresponding mechanical way to do this problem is go full Euler on it. And that's a fail-safe way of doing problems involving cosines. But this can save you some time. All right, I promised you that I would tell you, you know, like something about radio. I, I won't go into radio in depth. but, but how does this come up in real life? How does this come up in applications? Well, I chose these frequencies for a reason. Um, how many people know why I chose 440? It's, it's Go ahead, you tell me. It's like the A that you tune instruments. Yeah, it's the, like on a piano, it's like the A above middle C. You know, we're going to talk more about music uh, as we go along, but this is a really important frequency. It's what the, where you pin down the, the frequencies on a, on a piano too, and I guess, Folks who play stringed instruments also do that. And like, 
at the beginning of a concert, you know, you hear all the violins going, you know, I guess they're tuning to an A440, right? Um, anyway, so this is an audible. This is, this is in the audible range, whatever. And this, this frequency, like if you look at an AM radio dial, right, you'll see that the far left has 540 or 5.4 or something like that. And then it goes up. It, you know, you have like 660, 710, 740, 770, you know, 880, 1010. Like if you're from the New York City area, you know, you might have heard of like 1010 winds. That's this new station. You know, what do those numbers mean? Well, it turns out those numbers are kilohertz. Those are the number of kilohertz in what's called the carrier frequency for the AM radio station that you tune to when you slide the little dial or digital tuner to that frequency. So, so let's talk about that just a bit. Okay, so it's called FC, or I named it FC because, so th here's the terminology, FC is what's called the carrier frequency. of the AM signal. And why do we call it the carrier frequency? Well, here's the engineering problem. Say you have a concert, so some kind of musical signal that's going on in Carnegie Hall, you know, on whatever, Fifth Avenue and 54th or whatever it is, I don't know. Anyway, there's this concert going on, and you, like me, you, you grew up in Morris County. You know, maybe you grew up in Cedar Knolls or <laughs> whatever, someplace like that. And you want to you wanna listen to this concert, right? Okay. How, how do you get the concert to, from New York City to the person in New Jersey, you know, 30, 35 miles away? Okay, well, here's some bad solutions, like open the windows of Carnegie Hall. That doesn't work, okay? Doesn't work. Sound doesn't carry very well, you know? out of the through the through the atmosphere okay well how about this how about you take the concert signal which is going to be frequencies on the order of you know 440 hertz and maybe anything up to 20 kilohertz but anyway you have you have the concert signal and you turn it into an electromagnetic signal transduce it somehow put a mic on the orchestra and you run it up an antenna and you send that signal out through the atmosphere to new jersey okay that's a pretty good idea. But the problem is that frequencies on the order of 440 hertz, even EM signals of the, that frequency get attenuated badly by the atmosphere. They don't pass well through the atmosphere. So that doesn't work either. The solution is to somehow take all the data in that concert signal and and code it in a signal whose frequencies pass through the atmosphere well. And that's what the AM radio thing does. FC is the carrier frequency. Now, this is the reason they call it the carrier frequency is that here's the idea behind AM radio is the following that the atmosphere. passes, and uh, over the course of the semester we'll talk about filters, low pass, high pass, band pass, passes electromagnetic signals of high frequency, though especially ones that are of the frequency in this, uh, of the order of the carrier frequencies. So of frequencies on the order of FC, but not signals with frequencies on the order of those in S of T. Okay? So you're the engineer, you say, oh, well, the atmosphere th is a, is a clear path for signals of frequency FC on the order of FC. 
It doesn't pass signals on the order of the frequencies in S of t. What am I going to do? I'm going to somehow encode the info in S of t in a signal that will pass through the atmosphere and let that signal carry, hence the word carrier, carry the info in S of t through the atmosphere. So what X of t does essentially is encodes, quote unquote, and I'm not using that word in any formal information theoretic sense, the info in S of t in a signal that passes through the atmosphere. Essentially, this high frequency cosine carries that information from source to destination. Hence the name. So the fast cosine carries that info. Okay. Now, what happens at the receiver? You get this high frequency thing, and you want to recover that info. So at the receiving end, how do we recover S of t from X of t by, how do we do that? Well, we have a pic you have a picture of what X of t looks like in the time domain, right? It's this really fast cosine in between S of t and minus S of t. So if you, if you saw that signal, how would you recover that dotted curve? What's an obvious solution to that engineering solution? To recover, at least approximately, how would you recover that envelope? Yeah, you have an idea? I can tell. Yeah, yeah, like like specifically you're talking about the positive peaks, right? Yeah, like if you take all of those data points and like string them together, then you get an approximation of what S of T is supposed to be. Exactly. You you sort of you follow the peaks in a sense. You like if you looked at all those dots, that's what MATLAB looks like. It looks at all the time. It doesn't look at continuous thing, it looks at lots of dots. And when they're close enough together, you can't tell them apart, you know, from a from a smooth curve. You know, I take on my contacts, then I don't even know that Alex is back there, you know, or even a person is back there. But I don't need to do that to, to follow the peaks. And so that's what you do. You follow the peaks, positive peaks, in X of t. And that gives S of t at least approximately, not exactly. And how do you follow positive peaks? Like, if it, those of you who've taken circuits, you might, you might have an idea about how to do that. Yeah. Uh, low yeah, essentially, you could do like an RC low pass kind of thing, you know? And like, you, you f here's a peak, and here's the next peak, and so on. You, you, you get up to there, you charge it up, and, and it starts discharging while this thing goes negative, and then it, oh, then it catches that one, you know? That kind of thing. So you have these a whole bunch of these little exponential thingies connected together. That's following the peaks. And you can help that process by rectifying the signal, you know, with a diode, you know, getting rid of all the negative stuff. And actually, it, back in the day, we had a we had an ENGRI class in ECE that I taught for a number of years, where this guy who is kind of like a mad scientist from the area. You know, he's a historian of technology, came in and led this lab where you, you actually built, built a, a rudimentary AM radio yourself in the lab. And really all you need for that is you need a, an LC bandpass filter to pick out stations with a tunable C. And so you have to have a coil, you have to have a capacitor, and you need a diode and a resistor. And that's it. You know, no power source required because there's lots of power out there in the atmosphere. And Every year, some student would say, where do we plug it in? No, don't have to plug it in. You know, and we run the antenna out the window, and people could hear AM radio coming through. All right. 
So, so the carrier frequencies, the carrier frequency here, so on an AM radio dial are the carrier frequencies of the different stations in kilohertz. And so the numbers we're talking about are like 540, 660 in New York City, that's WFAN. You know, they have like Mets games and whatever. 770 or 7, 710, that's WOR. I don't know what they do now. 770, like when I was a kid, this was the station that everybody listened to. It had all the top 40 stuff and a lot of like really dramatic DJs. And you go to the beach and everybody had their little radio. See, this is before people wanted to listen to things in isolation through earpod, earbuds and, and AirPods and whatever. Everyone wanted everyone else to know what they were listening to back then. And everyone had these transistor radios, these little boxes, and you could hear the same song coming from all over the beach. So it was like, you know, whatever, lots of, etc. All right, so why these numbers? Well, it turns out that you want to make sure that the person sending the signal from this station doesn't interfere with the person sending signal from this station or this station, right? And so you want to make sure, essentially, that the spectra of the adjacent stations don't collide in spectrum space. And what that means is you can focus on this massive, complicated signal out in the air, which is actually the sum of all the stations coming at you, and zero in on one little band of it, the band around the carrier frequency, by using this LC bandpass filter, and then get everybody else's spectrum out, and all you're left with is the spectrum of your AM signal that you want to process, and boom, you get your S of T from following the peaks of that. Okay, so essentially, and the distance between the two, the adjacent frequencies, that's all about like how fast you have to sample, you know, Nyquist rate, all that kind of stuff, but we, we don't know enough to talk about that in depth yet. Okay, so the, on the incoming signal, so what a radio does, a radio, when tuned, say, to 770, what it does is it filters out the spectra of all the AM signals, the AM incoming signals, except the one carried by FC equals 770 kilohertz. And then it takes that signal and it processes that by a peak follower. Okay, so, so there's AM signals, there's where they come up in practice. And like I said, you don't have to have S of T be just a, a jacked up sinusoid, it could be anything that has a spectrum and there are ways of defining spectra for those sig other signals, but anyway. That's a good thing to know. All right. So moving right along, and we're, I'll talk briefly about FM signals at the end of the, this spectrum discussion. But first, I want to get into the, another important topic, which is essentially Fourier series. Actually, that's a good time to take the three-minute break today. So let's, let's do that, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next thing. All right. So, might as well just plow right along. Now I want to talk about a special case of this sum of sinusoids. So here's a special situation in the, in the sinusoid realm. And that is where you have x of t is the sum of a bunch of real valued pure sinusoids whose frequencies are what we call harmonically related. So x of t is the finite sum, or let's do indefinite article here, is a finite sum of pure real valued sinusoids whose 
fundamental frequencies are what we call harmonically related, which means that the ratio between any two frequencies is a rational number. So ratio between any two of the frequencies in this expansion is a rational number. All right, so what does such an x of t look like? So x of t is going to look something like this. You're going to have a constant term. Let's call that b0. And then you're going to have a sum from, say, let's use l. l equals 1 to cap l of cap b sub l cosine 2 pi f sub l t plus phi sub l. And the ratio between any two of these f sub l's is going to be rational. So it's not going to be pi. It's not going to be e. It's going to be something like you know 17 thirteenths or something like that, a ratio of two integers. Now, in this case, as we mentioned, I think two lectures ago, what's going to be true about x of t? If I take a sum of sinusoids, all of whose frequencies are related as rational numbers, ratios to each other, what kind of signal do I get? What, what, what property does x of t have? It's periodic, yes. OK, so the harmonically related f sub l's imply that x of t is periodic. And what, in general, is going to be the fundamental period of x of t in this case? We talked about that as well. I, I didn't prove these facts. I just told you that they were true. You can actually sit down and do the math, but it's not trivial. What, in general, is going to be the fundamental period of a signal like this? That's the sum of pure sinusoids with harmonically related fundamental frequencies. GCD. Who said GCD? You said it. OK. And in general, except for some really pathological special cases, well, they're not pathological in the sense of being ill or whatever. They are, they're like just really special choices of coefficients. And I'll give you one of those on the homework. Don't worry. So in general x of t has fundamental frequency. So the fundamental frequency of x of t is going to be f0 equals the GCD, GCID of f1, f2, up through cap fl, where this expression here means the greatest common integer divisor. And really, you know, I, one of the, that's GCD, all that kind of expression, greatest, like, you know, you've heard of greatest common divisor, least common multiple. Like, a, you know, those words always, when I was a kid, they kind of bothered me because greatest always sounded like, you know, Muhammad Ali, the greatest, right? So the greatest common, the best of all common integer divisors, and the least common multiple was the multiple that, that was the rarest of all. You know, it was the least common of all. So why don't we just call it the largest common integer divisor and the smallest common multiple? 
well, we don't do that because we like this sort of prosaic sort of 16th century math talk. And, and we still, like if, if I drew this symbol on the board, nobody's going to say that's the bigger than symbol, right? <laughs> right? OK. End of story. OK. So in general, the fundamental frequency of x of t is this. There are some borderline cases where it's not. But what, what does that mean we can do? We can, we can write, because uh, that's an integer divisor of all the f's, we can write all the f sub l's as integer multiples, positive integer multiples of f0. Okay. Thus, we can write each fl as a positive integer multiple of this fundamental frequency f0, because f0 is an integer divisor of all the fls. That means that all the fls are integer multiples of f0. And then we can recast, re-index, relabel things and write x of t as follows. So by re-indexing, relabeling, et cetera, and I'll go through an example of this, we can rewrite x of t as follows. x of t is equal to, I'll call it a0, plus the sum from, say, k equals 1 to cap n of cap a k cosine 2 pi k f 0 t plus phi k. Now where do these a's come from? Where does k come from? Whatever. First off, a 0 is just b 0. That's, that's the boringest part of it. So here, a0 is equal to b0, so the zero frequency term is the same, whatever. And for each k, so in general, we'll have cap n bigger than L, OK? You'll see this in the example. And in general, a bunch of these ak's are going to be 0. So some of the AKs are 0. And the ones that aren't are all the same as the Bs somehow. So each AK, each non-zero, each positive, so here AK is bigger than or equal to 0 for all K. And each positive AK is, quote unquote, one of the BLs. And each of the phi Ks is one of the phi Ls. OK, now this is, th th this, this is just a piece of mathematical sleight of hand to get x of t in a standard form. There's nothing mysterious going on here. But it's amazing how head spinning this turns out to be for some people. And that's OK. I, I shouldn't say it's amazing. It just is head spinning for people, some people. So let's go through an example of how this works. So here's an example. How about, how about uh, x of t equals, say, minus 13 plus 5 cosine 2 pi times 3 
t plus pi over 7 plus, say, 3 cos... No, let's not use 3 again. Let's say 11 cosine 2 pi times 5 t with no phase, something like that. All right? So what happens? You see that. You see that x of t out there on Hope Plaza, right? You see that the frequencies, so here, what is L for this? L equals, in the notation of our far left board, L is going to equal 2 because you have your B0 term. So B0 equals minus 13. B1 equals 5. B2 equals 11. And F1 equals 3. F2 equals 5. Phi 1 equals pi over 7. Phi 2 equals 0. That's what all the parameters of the B representation are for this x of t. Now, because last time I looked, 3 fifths is a rational number, right? The frequencies of the two cosines are harmonically related. And therefore, the fundamental frequency of this x of t, this turns out to be one of the general cases, OK? So the harmonically related frequencies, f1 and f2, implies periodic x of t. And the fundamental frequency of x of t is going to be f0 which is the GCID of 3 and 5, which is what? 1, because these guys are relatively prime. So it's 1 hert. No, hertz it sounds plural to me, but I always want to say hert when I have 1 hertz. Doesn't 1 hertz sound kind of wrong to me? Uh, I don't know. All right, so that's what F0 is. So what we're, gonna, what we're now going to do is now we're going to rewrite, we're going to just relabel things and write x of t as follows. Okay. x of t, and I won't say then because that sounds like a logical implication. Thus, x of t is equal to a0, so it's going to be minus 13 all over again, plus the sum from k equals 1 to, now I want to see if someone can guess what the cap n is going to be here. I'm going to write, I'll write it as n for now, a k cos 2 pi k f 0 t plus v k, where? All right, so you can stare at that for a second. You can tell me. And I'm, let's, let's have someone from the back row. No, let's. So I'm just trying to be, I'm just trying to say someone not you guys, OK, without saying someone not you guys. All right. <laughs> so um, what's going to be cap n? Remember, x of t, this is just x of t all over again with terms relabeled in terms of a k's and phi k's and kf zeros in terms of b k's and f1, Jack. What's that? Five. N is 5. Yes, very good. So n is 5. Right. And a0 pretty clearly is whatever it is. Minus 13, is that what it is? A0 equals minus 13. OK, so what is, what is A1? Zero. zero. Who said you said zero? How come? Because it's not 
Yeah, there's no one hurt term in x of t, right? So a1 is 0, and in fact, so is a2, right? Because there's no 2 hertz term. 2 hertz, that sounds right. How about a3? What's a3? Can you even see it over there? I, I forget what x of t was. Isn't that awful? Um, yeah, here it is. So what is a3? a3 is 5, right? Because it's the 3 hertz term has a 5. a4, again, is 0 because there's no 4 hertz term. a5 is going to be 11. And what is phi1, phi2 don't matter. phi3 is going to be whatever the phase is, pi over 7. And e you might as well just say, and phi4 doesn't matter, phi5 equals 0. And phi1, phi2, phi3 don't matter. They, they don't, we, we remain silent when asked what phi1, phi, or no, phi1, phi2, and phi4 don't matter. When asked what they are, we remain silent. Okay. All right, so all this is is a way of re-indexing the terms in x of t to come up with a standard form, yeah? n is 5 because that's the greatest frequency? Yes, n is 5 because the highest multiple of f0 that appears in x of t is 5 times f0, which is why you said n was 5 and you were right. Now this, this, it turns out, this is, the f this is the first step toward what are called Fourier series for periodic signals. And so this representation, this recasting, of x of t is the first step toward Fourier series for periodic signals. And before we move on to the, the general case of Fourier series, let's do let's let's draw the spectrum of this x of t just for kicks. So note that in this example, the spectrum of x of t looks like this. All right, I'm, I'm going to get you guys to help me out here. This is f. And x of t has terms of frequency that are multiples of f0. So let's make this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 hertz, and minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5. So where are we going to have? Where are we going to have stems, and what, what are the labels on the stems? Let's see if you guys can, can do this for us. Like, is there going to be a stem at frequency 0? No? OK, how many I hear some difference of opinion here. How many people think there is a stem at frequency 0? How many think there is no stem at frequency zero? How come? Don't mean to put you on the spot. Oh, Sorry, I won't. I, <laughs> oh, so I was thinking because like the A1 and A2 were zero. So maybe like, wait, no, that's frequency one. So frequency, yeah, frequency zero, that's the constant term. Constant terms are cosines of frequency zero, right? Okay. So, what you, what you have, the question you need to ask about x of t is, does x of t have a constant term, a non-zero constant term? And yes, it does. Indeed, it does. It has a minus 13 lead off. So what do we have? What do we have here at 0? We have a stem. And, and how long is the stem? 13. And what's the label on the stem? Yeah. Yes, 13e to the j pi, because it's a minus 13. 
it's not a 13. So 13e to the j pi. That's our stem at frequency 0. Now, where do we have non-zero stems otherwise? And? Yes. OK. So what is the one at 3? Uh, that's going to be how long? It's going to be? 5 or? Five halves. Who said that? Very good. Dan Yu, is that right? Yes. OK. I'm trying to remember everyone's names that I, that I learn as I go along. Um, so five halves. It's going to be five halves long. And this will be out of scale, but anyway. And what, what is the label going to be? It's going to be five halves. OK. Well, what if I want to look? No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, so, so what, what's going to be? This, this is going to have label 5 halves times something. Yeah, good job. And over here, you're going to have the same thing, but oh, conjugate symmetry, e to the minus j pi over 7. And then you're going to have a non-zero stem at 5, which is going to be of length 11 halves, right? And is that going to have a phase? No. So you're just going to have 11 halves there. Good. So that's what the spectrum of X of T looks like. And in general, you know, depending on how many non-zero terms you have, you're going to have a bunch of equally spaced stems. And the lowest frequency stem is going to happen at the fundamental frequency. And there may be zeros stems, or there may be non-zero stems. If you want to be complete, you can, you can draw zeros. Like a zero stem is just a dot here. And the picture will be conjugate symmetric. That's, that's the general situation that arises when you have the sum of harmonically related pure real valued sinusoids. Now, these are finite sums we've been talking about. And we're going to be talking about more general situation, but when, let me summarize this in a, in a mini theorem. So here you can summarize this as a sort of mini theorem. It's like, you know, this is the like Fourier with lowercase f, so to speak. It goes like this. If x of t is the sum, or is the sum of a finite number of real valued sinusoids with harmonically related fundamental frequencies, <coughs> then there exists actually there exist because there's going to be a little list here. There exist numbers, so a0, a k, or let's let's start with n. There exist, let's start with f0. There exist f0 bigger than 0, integer n, a bunch, a real number, a0, non-negative real numbers, a k, that run between 1 and n, and phi k in the interval minus pi to pi. such that x of t is equal to a0 plus the sum from k equals 1 to n of a k cosine 
2 pi k f 0 t plus v k. All right. That's our mini theorem. That's our, like our first baby step toward Fourier series. All right, now if we, if we go full Euler on the cosines in this representation, so th this is the end of the mini theorem. So we can indicate that by putting a, a little box there. <coughs> I wonder what this tape is for. If we go Euler on the cosines, so in any event, you get what? Well, you get x of t equals a0 plus the sum from k equals 1 to cap n of a k over 2 e to the j 2 pi k f 0 t plus v k plus a k over 2 e to the minus that so each of the cosines becomes two complex exponentials. And if you reorder, if you re-index things so that your k goes from minus n to n, this is the same as the sum from k equals minus cap n to cap n of little a k e to the j k 2 pi f 0 t. And what are the little a k's here? The a0 is just the same old a0 we've been lugging along all the time. But the non-zero k's give us a k's where a k, little a k is cap a k over 2 e to the j phi k. When k is bigger than 0 and the conjugate of that when k is less than 0. OK, so this is like step 2 in the direction of Fourier series. If this is step 1, this is step 2, writing it as a, a finite sum of complex exponentials whose frequencies are all multiples of f0. So this is sort of the official. So let's call this, give this a name, star, the expression star is the quote unquote official. The official way of writing the complex exponential Fourier series for the signal x of t. It's just another, it's a, it's a way of writing x of t as a sum of pure complex exponential sinusoids of frequency, all of, fre all of whose frequencies are integer multiples of f0. OK, so if someone comes up to you with a signal that's a finite sum, finite sum of pure sinusoids with harmonically related frequencies, you know right away that's periodic. And you know right away that you can represent it that way. OK. But there, it turns out there's a much stronger, much cooler result that holds in general. So there's a, a much stronger and use more useful result. I won't say that because that's kind of value laden. Stronger is two, I guess, but anyway. A much stronger result due to 
Fourier and others. And who's Fourier? Fourier was just some French guy, you know. He, he was, his, his name was Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier. And Jean-Baptiste is one of those throwaway first names, you know, like J. Paul Getty. They, everyone called him Paul, right? So everyone called him Joseph, even though his official first name was Jean-Baptiste, okay? He was a French mathematician in the 1900s who was interested in things like heat, fluid mechanics, all that. And he worked out an awful lot of important results that weren't totally rigorous when he was done with them, but they were, they were total right way to go kind of things that, that the real mathematicians later on refined and fixed and whatever. And you end up with the following result. You, if x of t is any periodic signal that's reasonable, and by the way, the criteria for reasonableness are eminently palatable, OK? There's nothing that's going to like make you think you're hamstrung by the reasonableness requirement, as we'll see next time. If x of t is a reasonable periodic signal, and let's, let's keep it real valued, so just for the heck of it. With fundamental frequency f0, there exist complex numbers little a k such that x of t and I'm stating the result in a casual way today. We'll do it more rigorously next time. x of t is the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of a k e to the j k 2 pi f 0 t. And what it means for an infinite sum to equal x of t, we'll talk about that and what it has to do with reasonableness next time. Just one additional gloss here, and that is that a sub minus k is the complex conjugate of AK for all K. So you have this conjugate symmetry going on. And this is called the Fourier series. For X of T. Now, before we quit today, let me just ask you, I know, I know that in some course or other, either multivariable or Diffie Q, you learn about Fourier series on some level, right? OK. Do they do the complex exponential version, or do they do the, just the sine-cosine version? OK. Let me tell you. The, the complex exponential version is much easier. OK. The, the formulas for the coefficients, there's no twos flying around. It's a lot more pleasant to deal with. So, so that's where we're going to go next time.